Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, welcome to our second webinar of the series, The Extension Agent of the Future. Uh, the topic of today will be adaptive extension, addressing the diversity of smallholder farmers. So uh, before I pass uh, on into our moderators, um, who will give a small introduction on this webinar, and I'm going to introduce myself shortly. My name is Berta Ortiz, and I am the coordinator of the community of practice in data-driven agronomy. Um, I'm going to be here making sure that everything runs okay. So if you have any problem with audio or any technical issue, please let me know through the chat box. And uh, yeah, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can put them in the question and answer box and please not in the chat box because otherwise it becomes a bit difficult for us to manage them. And yeah, the last thing I would like to say is that the link of the recording will be shared through the social media channels and the webpage of the community of practice. So yeah, without uh, further delay, I'm going to pass on to our moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. So hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Daniel Jimenez, the leader of the community of practice on data-driven agronomy. And I'm, and I'm pleased to see you all attending. Uh, just to remind you that this community of practice operates under the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. And that one of the main goals of this community of practice is to facilitate and communicate collective action around topics related uh, to data driven agronomy. So uh, a little bit of, of context. In October last year, and as a result of pre previous activities carried out by this community of practice, we propose to the community to elaborate on a topic related to how the extension agent of the future would look like. And more than 300 people participated and interacted around this topic during, during the big data convention in agriculture. And we got dozens of ideas on which aspects, angles should be explored on that topic. So this year we, we organize, uh, we've, been, we've been organizing several webinars based on, for example, the access uh, and tools for example, today that we're going to talk about the tools accessible to different cultures and languages, uh, the delivery, and what are the trade-offs and synergies between digital delivery models and more traditional participatory research methods like farming, farming field schools and, and other participatory research methods. Uh, also on analytics and how collective digital data can be turned into data-driven agronomy insights and finally, we will organize a webinar on uh, about youth and education and how to empower the, this new generation of extension agents with, with the right skills, knowledge, and attitudes. And all of that based on the, on the interaction that took place during the convention. And we had like 60 people uh, asking questions about this topic. So today, we will talk about access, as, as, as I said before, and uh, the content, the tools across the diverse socioeconomic and envi environmental systems. I'm sharing this moderation with David Guarena, my colleague. So I'll stop there and I'll hand over to David so he can introduce himself, the topic, and our first speaker. David. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so my name is David Guarena, and I work with Daniel at the Big Data Platform, leading some of the research and strategy components. And uh, as Daniel was saying, we were assessing what the, the pertinent topics would be you know, for this extension agent of the future series. And one of the topics that we were leading on or landing on are how do we both create tools that can reach many people, but at the same time, provide tools that are specific to individuals. And so, this this paradox is kind of challenging um, to to approach, and particularly as if we look at the different types of cultures and languages and cropping systems that exist across our target groups. So, based on that, we have uh, Peter Pipers uh, from IITA and Claudia Carvajal from PAD. So, I'll give a brief introduction to Claudia, then hand it over to her. So, Claudia is currently the regional director for Latin America for Precision Agriculture for Development, and Previous to that, she was the global research manager for the program uh, based in Delhi, India. So maybe Claudia, you want to take over and, and give us your presentation? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you to the team at SEAT for organizing this webinar. I am very excited to share a bit about our experience at PAD with digital extension. Um, let me um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, you can see it, right? Perfect. 
Uh, great. So um, my presentation is going to be divided in two big sections. The first one is the big picture talking about the organization, what we do and our model. The second one is more in depth into some of our programs. I'm going to talk about our biggest program that is in Odisha, India, a program in Kenya, and then our work with COVID. And the final section is more on experimentation in some results from A-B testing, but also how do we see experimentation uh, in the future? So to get started, um, PAD um, was created six years ago, and today we operate in nine countries. And we are starting, we're very excited because we're starting operations in Colombia and hopefully Brazil this year. We are a non-profit non -profit organization, uh, and we are currently reaching 3.7 million farmers. And what do we do? We reduce information poverty by providing actionable and customized information delivered through mobile phones. We do, the, we do this by innovating, learning, iterating, and scaling the use of technology, data science, behavioral economics, and user-centered design. All of this to support low-cost low cost services at scale. The sectoral challenge is that useful information and productive te technologies exist, but, but small, small uh, holder farmers often lack access to it. Um, most of the current extension uh, or the traditional model uh, that is in person has some limitation. It is very expensive uh, because it's hard to reach out to farmers, but it's also hard to train, deploy, and monitor uh, extension agents. Um, and then something that is also very relevant for the current context is that, as we have seen, it is difficult to implement these models in, in, in when there's a crisis uh, like COVID or a conflict. So. Um, PAD provides a solution to the sectoral challenge. We provide high quality and customized ag advice through mobile phones. We use information collected directly from farmers like location, agroecological zones, crop variety, and then publicly available ag data like soil type, pest and disease outbreaks. And we use both of these to generate customized content for farmers that cover from crop management advice, input recommendation, and more. Something that I want to mention is that um, in the geographies we work, feature or the simple phone uh, penetration is very high, but small, uh, smartphone penetration is often uh, very low. So that's why a PAD design services based on feature phones like SMS or voice messages. But we have the capability to develop additional functionalities for smartphone users like WhatsApp or video and photos. And as you can see from this graph, um, Digital solutions are growing rapidly. Um, the big question is, are they, do they actually work? Uh, and looking at some, at some studies from randomized controlled trials, we see that digital extension increases the odds of adopting recommended inputs by 22%. These results come from a meta-analysis of six RCTs in East Africa, out of which four are a, from a PAD. And the second one is a digital extension yields, uh, sorry, digital extension increases yields by a uh, 4% on average. This comes from the science paper published last year, um, and the, the source are seven RCTs in India and East Africa. So this increase, uh, 4% may seem like a modest increase, but we were at first, the, the first caveat is that this increase is an average effect among all farmers to whom messages were sent, including farmers who did not engage with the service. So we have really believed that farmers who actually adopt the recommendation may see higher impact. And, um, and the, the, the big point is that 4%, even at, uh, as a modest number, uh, if you think about the cost, that is less than $2 per farmer per year at scale, we see a very high social return on investment. And now that I described the big picture, I will talk about some of our projects. These projects are from different countries and reflect different implementation strategies. So I want to start with Odisha India, that is our pro biggest program. And this program is reaching more than 1.1 million farmers uh, currently. This service uh, engages with farmers at different stages of the process to maximize the relevance of the information. Um, to start, farmers are called by the call center to collect profiling information that would be, be used to customize the messages. Content is prepared by our ACT team in coordination with partners and, re and reviewed by a content review meeting with government experts and research organizations. Farmers interact with the service through push calls, that is when we send them information, 
but they can also call into the hotline and ask questions and listen to previous advisory messages. We conduct frequent feedback surveys to understand farmer engagement um, and, and understand how to improve it. Um, and something that I like to mention is that uh, we consider ourselves experts on delivering information to farmers at scale and at low cost, but we are not by any means uh, experts on content design. That's why we partner with organizations that have technical knowledge. Um, there are different organizations that we work with. Uh, some of them are think tanks, uh, nonprofits, research centers, uh, ag institutions. But for example, in India, we partner with CIMIT, uh, Visa, and TNC, uh, the Nature Conservancy, to manage crop residue burning. And we are also exploring a partnership with SIAT and the Ministry of Ag in Colombia. And diving a bit into, into um, how do we make the content different for different users, uh, we want to make sure that our services work for all groups um, and not only for the most visible male farmers. Um, in India, we spend a lot of time thinking about gender dynamics and strategies to leverage our service for gender engagement. We conducted a detailed analysis of the context through desk and field research, and we identified three key challenges for women. The first one is limited decision-making power on a stable and cash crops. The second one is limited access to mobile phones. And the third one are low levels of mobile phone literacy. Um, with this scoping, we identified solutions targeted that to each challenge. And we are now implementing strategies on content, content tailored to women like horticulture, life school, and fisheries, where they have um, more decision-making power. We are also partnering with nonprofits that have programs focused on women. And we are also disseminating content through platforms that are more widely available and bypass literacy constraints like community radio. And now I want to move to our um, program in Kenya uh, named MOA Info. Um, this program has a, around 550,000 users currently. So, something that is very interesting about this program is that. Um, this service offers another rich example of how PATH is capable of deepening a service over time. This program, the MOA Info program, started as a pest control service um, in response to the full army worm um, crisis that at the time was new to the region and was damaging fields of maize that is a regional staple crop. So we started with this unique goal. And then in response to farmer feedback and growing capacity, the service has been iterated to provide farmers and agro dealers with information on 11 crops and optimal input use, in addition to its foundational pest management advisory. Um, we have been able to learn a great deal from farmers subscribed to the service, uh, and we use this information to iterate and expand. Um, some of this information is reflected on the right side of this slide. And now diving into the details of the platform, this platform is again, um, allows farmers to pull content when they are looking for information about crop production or pest control, but they also receive push messages about the same farming practices. And something that I'd like to uh, highlight um, that is at the bottom of this slide on number five is that PAD has developed several decision support tools that help farmers optimize their decision-making. Um, some of, like the first one is a seed selector tool that uses information on farmers' plot location and preference for maturity duration, and then provides recommendations on the most suitable varieties of maize and beans. We also have a, pet, a, a pesticide tool a, and a fertilizer tool. And I think this section would not be completed without topic, talking about a, our work under COVID-19. First, uh, there's like a few things that we have done. Um, but the first one is that we put a lot of effort on understanding what exactly um, has been and continues to change. For example, we have been using our Q&A functionality um, to provide daily input on what are the type of questions that we're receiving. But also we launched a rigorous monthly a multi-country survey to understand what farmers and agro dealers are in need. Um, these, these insights were shared with the government um, that we work with uh, to use as an input for decision making. We also use our communication infrastructure to amplify some messages from the government, both on health and ag production. 
Um, we also added additional services to existing or traditional extension system to fill gaps that um, were um, a, that were because of the of the COVID pandemic. We partnered with IFAD on a rapid COVID ag response program to set um, up or expand services to uh, farmers in three countries. We um, we also provided some recommendations to overcome disruptions to markets. Um, and something that I also is very interesting is that we um, we realized that a children of farmers and children overall uh, were not in school anymore. So in Kenya, we piloted a new service where we send SMS messages with math problems uh, relevant to their grade, um, and then if uh, if they can provide um, a solution to the problem, problem they get uh, something harder and so on. And the last section uh, of my presentation is on experimentation. So, we conduct A-B testing, that is comparing two or more service design options to assess which one is preferred or more effective. And that helps us uh, inform rapid upgrades to our system. So far, we have run more than 60 A-B tests. And the first one that I would like to mention today is about the narrator gender. So we run an experiment in Uganda, Ethiopia, and India separate experiments to understand what is the impact of the, of the gender of the narrator. Very interesting results here. First, in Uganda, um, the intervention, um, the narrator didn't match, uh, we tested, sorry, whether the narrator of the message, uh, it, it didn't match their own gender of the farmer versus a narrator that is the same gender. And from a male to a narrator increase farmers engagement with pad content and then in india we see uh, we tested male uh, agronomists farmers and a uh, boys without occupational emphasis and a female boys uh, and we saw no statistical significant uh, difference in engagement rates based on the gender of the narrator and the last one is in ethiopia um, we tested female journalists male journalists and male agronomists and we found that both with pickup and listen rates were higher when content was voiced by a male narrator. So taking together, these results suggest that it is very important to have a contextually grounded um, approaches to, to problems because um, the small things like the gender of the narrator can have very different impacts on engagement in different settings. Um, I want to talk now about a, an A-B test that was conducted at Farm MOI Info. Um, the two research questions were, what is the best message to send to farmers to maximize the likelihood of completing the follow me worm a monitoring tool? And what is the best time of the day to send invitation messages? To test this question, two messages were designed and delivered to half of the farmers, randomly assigned. A, and message B was the one with the best outcome. And similarly, a, the messages were sent to a different times to test the best time of the day to send the messages, randomly assigned to. So we saw higher engagement at midday, so we decided to send message B at midday. And the last part uh, of my presentation today is going to be about adaptive experiment. That is something that we are trying to test and incorporate to our uh, model. So um, at PAD, research and implementation coexist in real time. And there are an infinite number of ideas. Um, and the impact of the different interventions is very like is unclear. So, we're exploring the concept of adaptive experiment that was advanced by Casey and Southman. Um, adaptive experiments are implemented in the form of A-B tests with many arms, um, with two or more rounds to enable adaptation. So we res researchers observe outcomes early um, and then adjust sample sizes for the different arms depending on their performance. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes, we do, Claudia. Okay, there was a bit of noise and I wasn't sure if, if someone needed to interrupt. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, so, and then um, they adjust the sample sizes for the different arms depending on their performance and they increase if, they, if they are, these arms are good performing, decrease if they're not performing well, repeat multiple times, 
And this allows uh, to maximize the number of beneficiaries receiving the best intervention and also empir empirically and efficiently. And the example that we have is a researcher at PAD work with Southman and Casey to implement this approach uh, to test how best to increase a response rate to the interactive voice response profiling survey. This is an automated survey in which we collect um, information that is going to be used to customize the service. Um, we were or we were testing if warning respondents that the call will be robotic instead of a person ahead of time would improve their ability to respond to this polling survey. So there were different arms. For example, uh, it was far in advance, like 24 hours or near the time of the call, one hour before, and then also in the morning or evening. Um, and the experiment reached when, sorry, the experiment stopped when we reached 10,000 farmers, which was the, uh, the pretty fine number. And we see that the success rate increased with morning call and SMS one hour before. And we see that some simple tweaks, uh, such as changing the time of the day or day of the call, um, can increase success rates. Um, so that's all uh, from my presentation. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for the for the presentation. So I'm sure that you know I, I have some questions already. So so, but now we will need to move to our next speaker. So uh, let me introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Pipers. He's a CGIR senior agronomist with experience in data science, and he currently leads the African Cassava Agronomy Initiative. So he will share with us his experience and lessons learned from his projects with the small holder cassava growers. So the floor is yours, Peter. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks also for the invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to present some of our work. Uh, very much appreciated. I'll uh, share my screen. So I'll talk a bit about the work we've um, we've been doing with uh, a project uh, Akai, the African Cassava Agronomy Initiative, which has developed an advisory service in the, for cassava growers um, called Akilimo. Um, just to give a bit of background on the on the project first, it's a it's a project that's been running now for well it's in its sixth year. It just got an extension, um, and it operates in Nigeria and Tanzania. It essentially provides um, um, advice on, on, on various operations, agronomic interventions, from fertilizer recommendations to intercropping advice, tillage, wheat control, and also advice on um, planting and harvest times um, for, 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 for farmers who supply to the processing industry. Um, we went through a sort of stepwise co-creation process, you could say. Um, we, we started back in 2015. Um, the literature then, then worked our way through to various prototypes um, until we arrived at what we're scaling today, which is, which is Akilimo. Um, talk a bit about, about that in a minute. But it's important that, that we just sort of took um, our partners um, along in that whole development process partners and their expansion agents who helped us test um, technologies on the ground, who, who found farmers who trials, who tested a lot of our prototypes and gave input on, on, on tools and helped us shape also our tools in terms of, of user experience and, and format. So today we, we now call it Akilimo, which is actually uh, two, two Swahili words um, together, Akili, which means brain, smart, and Kilimo, which is which is agriculture, and and giving that that service and name has has also really helped us to to get some traction to get some yeah, uh, partners behind behind the, the product and and scaling it. So it's a research product, but it's it's moving beyond that. It's it's also becoming much more of a of a community. Um, we often present it like this, like we we have a lot of. of Research that went into it on the left, and we have some central infrastructure set up um, on, a, on a server, on a cloud server, which runs recommendations and interacts with actually a, a range of, of interfaces that then relay those, those recommendations either directly to farmers or through extension workers um, to, to farmers. So we have both digital and, and analog interfaces. We, we um, I'll talk a bit 
for about that. Um, we, we have, actually we started with that, like very having very simple printable guides, um, information which, which, can, which can be printed on a pager and provide sort of the basics um, of recommendations on, on various aspects. You see some examples here. And, and those are accompanied with um, by, by some worksheets. Uh, we've, we've trained extension workers on, on how to um, how to use those. They're available in, in, in various different local languages. Um, and, and they help basically farmers, uh, extension workers to run through those, uh, those tools and develop recommendations which are uh, customized to their specific conditions. We, we also have an app on, on, for Android on, on the Google Play Store, um, which actually is, I think, our least used um, um, interface, uh, um, mainly because I think as, as you heard previous speakers say, uh, smartphone penetration is, is really quite low. And the same is true for, for Nigeria and for Tunisia. Um, and then we also partnered with, with um, Arifu Isoku and Viamu, who are lab companies operating both in Nigeria and Tanzania. Um, and they basically integrated our advice into, into their services. So Arifu runs a, a chatbot. Um, Isoko has, has interactive SMS messaging. And Viamo has, has a, their three to one service, which is, which is IVR based. This is an example of what it looks like on, on Arifu's chatbot, which basically runs on, on a number of chat applications, but also on, on SMS. And so today we actually, through our partnership, have, have over 170,000 registered users. And what is interesting is that, that all our partners sort of integrated Akilimo in, in a way that, that suited their operational strategies, but we have a common ME system, a monitoring system in place across all those 30 partners to really um, register whoever is, is reached, is exposed to the, to the tools. Um, we report uh, what insights they gain, whether they continue using our tools, and then whether they also effectively change their practices and, and benefit from those practices. And so now I'll share just uh, maybe a couple of insights that we've um, we've gained through that common monitoring system. I'll just show a couple of graphs and, and we implemented various ways or we tried out various ways to actually get feedback. Um, but in this presentation, I'll talk mostly about um, the work we've done through telephone interviews, which, which allows us in 10 to 15 minutes it, it takes per interview to really look a little bit more extensively at, at drivers for, for use, continued use of the tools and to take the right recommendations. Um, just maybe something on, on gender first. Um, I think that's interesting to look at. If we look at um, the users we, we currently have that have registered, um, we see that, that through our partners, actually, there, there is some gender gap. We, we more often reach men than, than women. That's true in both countries, so a bit closer, but a bit more balanced in Nigeria. Um, and what we also see is that, that for them, those farmers who want to continue directly using the service, very often uh, there's, a, there's a second element that, that contributes to that gender gap because very often women um, often do not own, less, less often own a phone than, than men do. And that again, we see in both countries. So if you add those two things together, we see that actually about you know, 30 to 50% less women Kassava can really access the recommendations themselves after being exposed um, to that initial um, event by our partners. Um, bit more than if you if you look at a little bit more detail what is also interesting is that that what you see is that that gender balance if you look at it for each each partner you find often that those partners who invest um, in, in having a higher gender balance also in their extension agent network typically also achieve higher gender balance in their in their um, their farmer clientele that they that they reach that's very obvious in Nigeria, maybe a bit less so in, in Tanzania. Um, there's a couple of exceptions there. 
but generally organizations that that you know I think um, really invest in, in in attracting female extension agents also reach higher uh, gender balance and, and that I think is is one first element that that really points at, at the importance of having extension groups on the ground um, who, who support services. Um, then just some general results around what we call use and uptake. Use really just refers to, to after that initial event, how often do those people continue to, to use our tools and, and go back to obtain new recommendations. Um, and uptake refers to, to um, um, whether they then effectively apply um, those recommendations in their, in their farms. And we have a detailed way of, of actually quantifying what aspects and in, in to what degree they actually get those recommendations. So this really shows that there are really big differences between the two countries. In, in Nigeria, there is generally much higher uptake and, and use than in Tanzania, um, while the actual differences between the two gender groups is, is not that strong, at least not as strong as, as it is in the groups. Um, so that's interesting and, and digging a little bit deeper into that and coming back to, to the importance of, of having access to that, to that in-person, on-ground extension support. What we see is that looking at uh, to what extent um, farmers continue to use our tools, there is a an enormous, enormously prominent effect of whether they actually have access to an extension agent on the ground who supports them with that. So on the left, um, you, you, see, you see the distributions without for farmers who do not have direct extension agent support versus on the right with. Um, and then the, the different rows there are, are different methods by which farmers were initially exposed to, to the Akuluma tool set. So you also see quite quite important differences between the, um, the different uh, dissemination approaches and, and maybe known is that, that field days are typically one of the least effective methods to get people to develop new practices. Um, interesting for us is actually that, that video shows which are a relatively cheap method um, are, are amongst one of the most um, effective effective methods. Um, interesting maybe also is, is to look at the third row from the bottom, which is, which is Soko's SMS service, where you see that in Tanzania, that's actually one of the most successful um, um, methods or partners in this case, um, although still much less effective than, than the numbers we see in Nigeria. But even for, for a, a user base like, like with Isoko, who is, who is used to interacting with a digital service, um, you see again that, that when those farmers have access to a, an on-ground, um, in-person extension agent support, that, that um, yeah, use of those tools actually more than, more than doubles. So that's sort of a second element that points that, that really having access to that on-ground extension service is, is something that, that should not be overlooked. It's really important. Um, another thing to show is that maybe, maybe, maybe more obvious is actually that, that if you look at amongst all those users, there, are, there is huge variation. And there are a lot of different factors that contribute to that, that variability. But one of the more important ones is, is to what extent these farmers have access to the market and the ability to, to invest. So the, the certain wealth status that allows them to actually invest. So here on the, on the x-axis, you see to what extent um, they rely on cassava to generate income, which basically means that, that they have access to a, to a market and, and produce for that market. You see that, especially for um, use of, of fertilizer recommendations in both countries, and also for, for advice on, on planting and harvesting in Nigeria, um, those farmers with, with that, that really apply our direct recommendations in their fields typically also derive higher portions of their income um, from cassava. So those are more 
commercially oriented farmers um, who, who typically also have the ability to, to invest. We also did some work around, around more like around perceptions and behavior and, and access to services in general. Um, and, and this slide just shows a couple of examples of, of statements that we put in front of those farmers. Um, a sample of those farmers, and we asked them to what extent they, they agree with such statements. Um, and you see that actually those with, with higher use and uptake um, can be distinguished based on their on their responses to, to such statements, but um, that differs between the two countries quite quite strongly. For example, uh, in terms of access to credit, you see that. There's more red there for Nigeria, but there's not really any difference between the rows in, in, within Nigeria. So farmers in Nigeria generally don't access credit or have difficulties accessing credit, and they perceive that as a limitation. But that's, that cuts across both the low, medium, and, and high users of, of, of our tools. While in Tanzania, um, that doesn't seem to be perceived as much at least as, as a limitation, but you can see that those with low use typically um, perceive access to credit or affordability of, of making those investments as a limitation. So we had like sort of 20 to 30 of such statements and, and uh, we kind of grouped them and then did, did an analysis that actually looks at the relative importance of, of different aspects of our tools. And what we learned is that in Nigeria, use of the tools is mostly constrained by the type of dissemination support, the type of dissemination events, and how they've been exposed, and to what extent they actually can receive support from, from all ground extension agents. While in Tanzania, the, the constraints are much more related to, to market, market access, to cost and risk implications. Farmers generally are, are quite risk adverse for investing in cassava. Very often they consider um, the market situation uh, not very favorable to, to make such investments. Um, also important to note is actually that, that uh, the perceptions around tool format and user friendliness of our tools are, are much, much more important than, than the actual perceived benefits around yield and profit. So the actual performance and the, and the precision of the advice seems to be less important to those users than, than how easy it is for them to, to obtain the recommendations. So that, that's maybe something interesting for, for, for the scientists to note. Um, some conclusions just to finish up. Um, first of all, I, I hope I made my point that I think access to, to in-person extension support is, is really critical, at least, at least in the initial stages. Maybe as a joke, you could say that in the future, an extension agent might look something like this. Um, but the point is, I think that person on the ground will, will be needed in the future. So we'll never be able to be replaced by, I think, a fully digital service. At least that's what our data seems to suggest. Um, another point I think is that going digital does not automatically bridge the gender gap. I, I think I think that that's some of our data that we learned as well that, that there's definitely potential to, um, to to close that gap with digital approaches, but it will not happen without actually making investments on the ground as well. Um, I think something we've learned as well is that by having this sort of diverse set of, of formats and tools to provide our recommendations, we've been really able to, to um, uh, increase user uptake by actually uh, allowing users to interact with our recommendations based on their own capabilities and preferences. Um, I think this is quite obvious, but, but I think users are diverse and and, and we see really in our data as well that those with the commercial interest, those with the, the capability, to, to, capability to invest, and those with good linkages to the market will always be the pioneers to invest uh, in, in, in those recommendations first. And lastly, um, I think that also the previous speaker pointed to is that the constraints will always be dependent on local conditions and that contextualization of of, of the of the tools as well as the 
approaches to, to, to bring it across to the users is, is very, very important um, and critical for, for any success of such services. With that, I just want to quickly also acknowledge that we work with a lot of partners. So what I'm presenting here is, is, is really with contributions of many, many organizations. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, be happy to answer any any questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Claudia. Uh, very nice presentations. So uh, we'd like to transition this into a Q and A session. Uh, if you have any more questions, please just post them into the Q and A chat box. Otherwise, we'll be going from the first one to the last one. So the first one is from Benedict. Uh, he's asking. Regarding MOA info, may I know the response rate of farmers for this two-way platform? And I believe that's for Claudia. Yeah, I, I can share more details on um, on the. I, I don't have on the top on the top of my head the specifics of each program's um, response rates, but what we have seen is, um, I think response rates are harder to measure for uh, SMS services uh, because uh, with voice messages we we record both listening and pickup rates with sms messages we can only measure the inbound so like like farmers are actively engaging with the service so i can look into um, the specifics if, if you are interested uh, i um, yeah i don't have the details on top of my head great thanks uh, so the next one is from uh, peter he's asking how much does the pa platform differ between countries and what are the key characteristics of the platform in Rwanda? Okay, that, that's a very interesting question. So our services are tailored to the um, needs of each uh, setting. So before we launch a service, we do uh, some extensive work to understand uh, what are farmers' preferences. For example, in Kenya, um, it's a, Kenya is a country in which uh, everyone is used to digital, like SMS-based platforms. Um, and SMS are very common and people are very like both comfortable and engaged with the services. So we decided to go ahead with SMS messages uh, in Kenya. On the other hand, for example, in India, we see that literacy rates are much lower than in other countries. Um, so SMS messages may uh, complicate the situation. And the other uh, key point is that India has so many languages that have different scripts um, that sending SMS messages gets very complicated because you can only fit a, a few words in each message and then it gets very tricky so what we decided in india is that we uh, we would implement a voice-based uh, services so all our services in india um, rely on voice tools and then for example in um, the, the approach of the services is also different in some countries we are focused on uh, supporting a for example an existing operation so we have done a lot of trials with one acre fund to support the existing programs uh, that they have. Um, and in case of Rwanda, we're working with Rook Capital, we're working with um, the government and also with One Acre Fund. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from, is from Benedict. Uh, and this is going to Peter for Apilino. When you say customize for specific conditions, is this per farmer or for a cluster of farmers? Um, it depends a bit on the on the interface used, but it's mostly per farmer because most of the interfaces actually require farmers to give certain input like their planting dates, their location, um, their previous yields. Um, they can also indicate the prices that they expect to obtain um, their preferred market. Um, but the level of precision will really depend on, on the interface. Uh, the app typically gives the most precise because it, it runs all the calculations on the fly. Um, while in the IVR system, for example, we've, we've discretized all our, all our recommendations um, because there are just uh, limited choice options uh, to, to each of those questions. So, but, but it is as much as possible really tailored to individual users. Great, thank you. A follow-up question from Benedict, uh, again to Peter. For Akilimo, what is the main use of geographic uh, extrapolation? Um, 
I'm not sure I'm, I'm interpreting it right, but we use the GPS location essentially to, to pick up um, soil information as well as, as weather information. So our recommendations um, are based on, for example, for fertilizer use, we need soil information to calculate um, nutrient supply from the soil. Um, and we use GPS location along with planting date to, to kind of um, determine a, an expected weather pattern uh, and then and then calculate sort of attainable yields from from that. So that, that's why we use geographic uh, GPS location, if I interpret that correctly. Great, thank you. Next question from Alex. Again to Peter, how specific are the planting dates that need to be reported by the farmer? For example, is it an exact date or just month and week? Yeah, cassava is a bit of a tricky crop because in, in Nigeria they almost plant it sort of at any point of the year you can you can find farmers planting except maybe right in the in the dry season. Um, but we use weekly intervals, so we allow farmers to to to, to specify a, a specific date, um, but our calculations are based on on weekly weekly intervals. Thank you. Okay, another one from Alex to Peter. In the chat bot, do you ask the farmer their location or how do you know where the farmer comes from so you can offer the correct recommendations? Um, we, we use second level administrative units. So, so there's a question in there that actually allows farmers to indicate in, in which state and local government area in Nigeria they're, they're located in. Um, and, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think that information is stored so that when they return, that question is is skipped. Um, so they only it's only asked, I think, once. Okay, then we have a question, a general question for everybody, for both Claudia and Peter, uh, from Michael. He's asking, please say something more about the sustainability of digital services beyond projects. What are the models that show commercial sustainability? I, I can I can respond to this one first. So um, at PAD, we're exploring different models uh, uh, on how to operate our program. So uh, one of the models that we're exploring is the build operate transfer model in which we build and operate a program on behalf of, let's say, the government. And then once we reach a we, 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 if we implement the program for three years, we also train the government for them to take over uh, this program at the end of the at the end of the three year um, plan. And um, that means that uh, they can um, take the program and continue uh, after the funding uh, ends. And the other option is uh, obviously um, commercial uh, solutions. We are exploring in India some uh, revenue generation um, alternatives to. Uh, depend a little bit less on um, funding from governments or donations or grants um, and a bit and think about what are the other ways in which we could um, get some funds without charging farmers for the service. Great. Peter, do you have any comments on that question? Yeah, I mean, it's a very relevant question. And I think for us as a, as a research organization, a bit of a, of a tricky one. Um, what we've built is really built as, as a research product. Uh, and, and I think our, our path to sustainability was really to, to partner with these digital lab companies and see how that integration would work. And, and, um, and I think we, we have some successes there, but there are still many questions unsolved around maintain and keep it all up to date that sort of content um, and in the meantime also there is there is excellence in agronomy which is which is an, a new initiative um, growing within within the one CGIR now that that, that will I think um, take in a lot of, of our tools and approaches that, that we've built and, and adapt these to to other crops in other regions and with other partners so I think those are sort of the, the two main pillars for for sustainability um, um yeah for, for for something that that i think like like akilimo that that we've developed yeah yeah very interesting and pertinent question i think a lot of these things are unanswered uh okay so final question 
This is directed towards Peter. Aki Limo currently focuses on cassava. Do you think it would be easier to expand to other crops or to other services slash credit? Any plans to expand the service in either of these directions? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, we, we, we are in the process of adapting it to um, potato for Rwanda. So we have a, a little project ongoing um, funded by, by RTB um, where, where we've actually applied all of our tools and methods and, and been able to actually develop fertilizer recommendations for potato. And now trying to scale those together with, uh, with One Acre Fund and, um, and RAB in, in Rwanda. Um, we've also tried out our modeling framework on maize, and, and it seems to hold quite well, um, though we've not really gone much further with, with those efforts. But like I said, I think it's, it's for Akilimo, it's not really the, the, the service as such that we want to um, scale and, 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 and sustain, but, but really the, the approaches behind and we'll see to what extent we can adapt those to, to other crops in other regions. Great, thank you. Um, and any questions from the panelists? Maybe I, I have one. Um, so this is towards Peter. Uh, under, you know, there's a new initiative, right? Under the 1CG, the take, uh, Excellence in Agronomy Program. Um, could you describe perhaps to everybody uh, a bit about this program and, and how digital services and digital extension might play into the development of this new program? Uh, yes, sure. It's it's a, it's an initiative that is kind of currently running under an incubation phase, um, which actually brings uh, many of the CG institutes together, um, and is aiming at, at sort of um, streamlining and, and and efficiency gains in in the development of, of research products to to provide agronomic advisory. Um, it currently has ten use cases, all run by by um, different institutes, sometimes. Um, more than one institute per use case on, on different crops on three continents. Um, and, and we hope to expand that as, as, as one, of the, um, one of those initiatives in the one CGIAR, uh, bringing you know, the, the, the sort of tools and approaches that, that I, I, I sort of presented here um, to, uh, yeah, to, to, new, to new use cases, to new products and, and with a whole range of, of service providers, both, both digital and, and more traditional. Um, but it is indeed, it's, it's an effort to really bring a lot of the agronomy research together across the whole CG. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for all the, the time and the presentations and the questions. I mean, Daniel, uh, you wanna maybe wrap it up a bit? Yes, so thank you, Pierre and, and Claudia. So the idea of this webinar was to, to know lessons learned from a couple of two initiatives that have succeeded delivering information to small uh, scale farmers, but more importantly, tackling different cultures and languages. So we listened to some experiences from India, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, Tanzania, and how actionable, customized, and tailored information is delivered to support local services. So Claudia made an important point on something that I keep hearing in the uh, extension of advisory services space, and, and that is in how to um, set up these public and private partnership models like, like they did in India in order to have the best of each organization according to the expertise, like developing content, content or delivering information. Um, in Kenya, the development of the decision support system based on, on farmers' needs. And, and I was surprised by, by Claudia and, and, the, and, and the findings about the difference that it can make uh, the gender narrator or the time of the day when delivering a message. I haven't thought, no way, I haven't thought uh, about it. Uh, uh, I didn't see that coming actually. So it's very important that you share that, that experience with us. Uh, from, from Peter and Aquilimo, I mean, we saw different ways to provide tailored agronomic services, uh, ranging from printable guides, SMS, the, SMS messages to smartphone apps. And it was also important to know that going digital, as he said, doesn't necessarily mean that the gender gap is bridged. And Peter make a point on something that I also heard in the extension of advisory services space. And it was that in-person extension support, right? When he made a point on that. 
And, and it's been reporting for many farmers that develop in the developing world that in some geographies without the human engagement, they think it's very hard to develop trust. And, and last but not least, uh, um, um, how in a country, the use of tools is constrained by access to, to extension support and in other countries is not necessarily what happened. So, so I, I'm very happy with the session. And, and I mean, we, we, we truly believe that, that this type of tools, this type of delivery messages will tackle a huge problem that we have in the developing world. And it's, and it's also been reported in, a, in an article in Nature last year that in the developing world, uh, Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, extension, traditional extension services only reach 10% of farmers. So, so I'm sure that with these type of tools, with these initiatives, I hope that we can learn each other and, and, and reach more, much more farmers. So thank you much to both of you for your time and sharing your experiences with us. And to all of you to remember that the next webinar will address the delivery aspect and the extension agent of the future. What are the trade-offs and the synergies between digital delivery models and more traditional participatory methods? So thank you, thank you very much. And bye-bye, David, do you want to say goodbye? Goodbye to everybody. Thanks for okay. participating. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.